Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and start. And uh, we'll start with the foundation of all good qualities, that Lam Rim prayer by Lama Tsongkhapa, um, so that we have the whole path uh, clearly in our mind. And we use it as a way to set our motivation as well. So that prayer um, I emailed to you, it's called Lam Rim Prayers, but I'll do share screen. And so try and uh, connect with the meaning of these verses as we go along. You can kind of uh, sit with it in a reflective, meditative way. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to them is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pradamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows in Samaya. As I become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajidara. And so just sitting with that, So, so that prayer is uh, really important, very popular, very common to find. Um, there are a lot of beautiful commentaries on it. But uh, for the Islam Rim semester, I think it's really good to kind of remember the whole thing because we're diving into the chunks one by one. And so you don't kind of lose the context, what comes before, what comes next. So today we're going to be looking at 
uh, lineage a little bit and more on the guru possibly. Um, but what we really want to be looking at is this concept of what is a blessing, right? Um, in the prayer, it says, please bless me this, please bless me that. It sounds very religious. It sounds very blind faith. It can sound very separate from our experience as modern people. But what's meant by blessing in Buddhism is an inner request for transformation, right? So you're asking the quote external to bless you, but really what you're saying is, may I be receptive to the wisdom I seek? You know, I'm seeking wisdom, I'm seeking transformation, I'm seeking development. And it's a outward reaching kind of energy, but it's actually an inward invitation of receptivity. So Buddhists define blessing as that which transforms the mind. That which transforms the mind is a blessing. And so it can have this connotation like it's been bestowed upon you like fairy dust. When in fact, what's happened is that you are being flooded by the Dharmakaya holy mind of all of the Buddhas every second of every day and are only receptive in a limited way based on karma and based on the immediate mental attitude you're having. So prayers are like telling yourself what you already believe so that you listen for it. Yeah, you're telling yourself what you already think is a good idea, what you already believe to be true, what you already want to reinforce and live by. And by articulating it out loud, and by kind of calling it and reaching towards it, what you're actually doing is opening. Does that make sense? So of course, there is something, quote, external, something outside of yourself, wise and more developed. But your access of it is very much about the inner guru and the bridge that you're building with it. So when we talk about blessings, it leads very naturally to then a discussion of lineage. And in Buddhism, lineage is a vital conversation if you don't know where a teaching came from and the context from which it was taught, um, you're missing out on a huge part of the story. If you look at, for example, the three turnings of the wheel, divorced from context, you think the Buddha is teaching three different things that are seemingly contradictory. If you realize that he's teaching three levels of subtlety to suit the minds of the people in front of him, you see it as very skillful means and brilliant. Um, you can see it as, okay, here's what I intellectually can hold, but then here's what I can emotionally process or experientially process. And there's a little bit of space between the two. So intellectually, I'll be up here and then gradually in my heart, I will be here and eventually they will meet. But the Buddha is very skillful to understand that we are led in a gradual way and that we're not all in the same place either. So lineage is important because you want to understand what is this person's relationship to the Buddha? Because we're relying on the unbroken oral tradition from the Buddha up until this present day. And the transmission of the Dharma, of course, is going to be filtered by people's own projections and experiences. It's only natural. Commentaries are going to be colored by the life experiences of the people connecting to the teachings. So you want people that have an experience of the teachings, not just a scholarship of the teachings. So when we look at the Lam Rim, it becomes really, really important to understand how on earth did the Lam Rim teachers and the Lam Rim scholars come to decide which teaching comes first and which teaching comes second? How did they come to decide the categorization of the three scopes small, middling, and large? How did they understand the three types of beings? Because the Buddha, of course, taught all of these things, but he taught so many different times in so many different ways because the Buddha was speaking directly to the audience in front of him what that particular specific audience needed. So he might have taught the Bodhisattva vows 12 times 
And for some, it was um, kind of a preliminary teaching. For some, it went without saying, and they already knew it. For you know, it meant something different to each audience. All of the teachings are like that. He taught the teachings multiple times, but slightly different nuance depending on who was in front of him. So the Lam Rim is this incredibly tidy text, right? It's so tidy, it's so organized. And how can we rely on the tidiness as not just someone's view of, it makes sense to put it this way, I'm just gonna organize it this way because, you know, <laughs> the, the, the Kangyur is 108 volumes and it's 40 years worth of material. Let's just condense it into three little books and just make it in a way that makes sense to me, you know? We want to have some sort of confidence that the Lam Rim is actually an accurate organization system and is actually precisely directing us to the order of practice. So in order to do that, we have to kind of understand where it came from. And it can be a little bit like history lesson-y, but if we can hear it more as like story time in one sense, but also like joyful history, because it doesn't mean that enlightenment stopped with Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha was not the first Buddha. He was not the last Buddha. There were tons of Buddhas in between. Some of them outed themselves as Buddhas. Some of them were stealth Buddhas, but tons of Buddhas after the Buddha is great news. But also that there were people who were almost Buddhas that were very amazing, accessible teachers. And in some ways, sometimes those teachers who were nearly enlightened or not quite enlightened for us can sometimes be more accessible because they're closer to our own experience. So it's a whole kind of mixture of things in the Lam Rim that you'll find. There is direct quotes from the Buddha, there is logical syllogisms, and then there's quotes from other teachers, some of whom were enlightened at the time of their teachings and some of whom weren't. And Lama Samkhapa brings it all together to prove one point at a time. So the Lam Rim Chenmo is not like just his words. It's like, here's what the Buddha said, here's what this scholar said, this scholar said, and this scholar said. Here's a common argument. Here's a common example. Here's some poetry. Here's some practice advice. And next. You know, it's incredibly elegant the way it's been put together. So I'll just give us a little background in your book, Practicing the Path. I'm just going to read a really short section. It starts on page 12. And I'll put it on the screen, but if you want your own in front of you, it starts on page 12. The first section is from the Lam Rim Chenmo itself. I prostrate to the Guru Manjushri. Body produced from millions of excellent virtues speech fulfilling the wishes of countless sentient beings, mind seeing all objects of knowledge as they exist, I prostrate to Shakyamuni Buddha. So that's from the Lam Rim Chenmo itself. That's what Lama Tsongkhapa said at the very beginning of the text. Then Yangzi Rinpoche who wrote this commentary says, according to custom, a philosophical text in a, the Tibetan tradition begins with lines of praise, the author's commitment to complete the writing, and words of encouragement for the student to study and practice the subject matter. This, the praise may be dedicated to Manjushri, or to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, or to any of them. The object of praise depends on the subject matter. Texts from the Vinaya Pitaka traditionally begin with a praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. Texts from the Sutra Pitaka traditionally begin with lines of praise to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And texts from the Abhidharma Pitaka often begin with lines of praise to Manjushri. Alternatively, we can say that when the praise is directed to Shakyamuni Buddha, it indicates that the subject of the text will be the higher training in ethics. When the praise is directed to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the subject matter will be the higher training in concentration. When the text begins with praise to Manjushri, the subject matter will be the training in higher wisdom. So these praises and these prostrations, these homages, these are not accidental or just kind of romantic connection with, with whatever teaching or deity, they're specifically indicating what the subject matter is gonna be. 
So the Lamrim begins with the words, Namo Guru Mandragoshaye, which is a line of homage in Sanskrit. The Sanskrit is used in order to create a connection to the source language in the mind of the reader, to encourage receptivity to the blessings of this particular text, and also to establish the authority of the text as having been translated from the original language. The translation of this particular Sanskrit line is, to the guru, Manjushri, I prostrate. Arya Manjushri and Lama Tsongkhapa had an extremely close relationship, that of teacher and disciple. Lama Tsongkhapa received extensive teachings from Arya Manjushri on both the profound view of wisdom and the extensive method of conduct. And thus he offers the first line of praise to Arya Manjushri, his guru. The second line of praise is offered to the body of Shakyamuni Buddha. This is followed by praise of the speech, which fulfills all the wishes of sentient beings, and praise to the holy mind of Buddha, which sees all existence exactly as it is. These lines of praise are meant to indicate to us that enlightenment is not self-arisen, but rather from results from causes and conditions that are virtuous by nature. These causes and conditions are the determination to emerge from cyclic existence or the mind of renunciation. The wish to attain enlightenment solely for the welfare of others or the mind of bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing emptiness. These in turn come forth as a result of extensive listening to the teachings, cultivation of the understanding of the teachings and subsequent meditation upon them. The result of the complete accumulation of the merit of virtue and the merit of wisdom is the enlightened holy body, holy speech and holy mind. If we reflect in this way on the significance of these lines of praise, a sense of faith and respect will arise easily and there will be much greater meaning in the praise and prostrations that we offer. The next stanzas of praise in Lamrim Chenmo are offered to Arya Manjushri and Arya Maitreya and then to Nagarjuna and Asanga, who are considered the great revivers of the teachings of Buddha. The main lineage of the profound path of wisdom begins with Manjushri and is passed to Nagarjuna. In the same way, the lineage of extensive path of method is passed from Shakyamuni to Maitreya and then Asanga. Nagarjuna came about 400 years after the passing of Buddha and Asanga came about 500 years after that. Both were foretold by the Buddha or prophesized. These two lineages were eventually combined in Lama Atisha, who was regarded as the treasury of the essential advice of Buddha. The last verse of praise pays homage to the eyes that view all the vast teachings, the spiritual teachers, Lama Tsongkhapa, all the direct and indirect gurus, the Kadampas of the textual lineage, <clears throat> and the Kadampas of the instruction lineage. These lineage holders and one's own root guru are considered to be the supreme gateway to liberation. The next stanza addresses Lama Tsongkhapa's personal reasons for undertaking the writing of this text and his pledge of commitment to writing it. Earlier, we discussed the external conditions that contributed to its writing, etc. Arya Manjushri's involvement, auspicious gathering, and so forth. In addition to that, the internal conditions were Lama Tsongkhapa's strong wish to clarify the ignorance of sentient beings, his wish to show that the various teachings of the Buddha are the one medicine eliminating all suffering, and his wish to complete the offering of practice to his teachers. The promise to compose the text is followed by the presentation of the description of the disciple who is qualified to receive these teachings. Such a disciple must be blessed with a perfect human rebirth, must have the wish to make that rebirth meaningful, must possess a mind not darkened by bias. He or she must also be honest and blessed with the ability to discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. You know, that kind of nutshell presentation that can go on for days and days if you're doing um, the Lamrim Chenmo over a long period of time. There's tons of lineage holders. There's a lot of influences for those main kind of trailblazers. But what's interesting is that Buddha Shakyamuni prophesized Nagarjuna and Asanga. 
He said, basically, don't worry, the Dharma is going to go strong for about 300, 400 years. And then there's not going to be a lot of people that remember the whole teachings. It's going to start to degenerate. It's going to start to fall apart. There will be corruption and misunderstandings and wrong views and influences from corrupt individuals. And then there will be another person who, and will tidy it up again. So he was basically saying it's only natural that teachings will become degraded if ordinary people are the only ones holding them. You know, even with the best of intentions, people bring in their own bias and they bring in their own misunderstandings. But there will be enlightened beings who then take my teachings again, clarify them, tidy them up and move them forward to the next generations. So it's, it's reassuring. It's interesting. Um, sometimes I've quoted that famous quote from um, Padmasambhava, Guru Rinpoche, who brought Buddhism from India to Tibet. Uh, he prophesies that, you know, when our um, people are scattered like ants throughout the world and the iron horse cuts through the land and uh, the iron bird flies, then the Buddha Dharma will come to the land of the red-faced people. Right. And that was, um, you know, a long time ago. He prophesied that like a thousand years ago. And here we are today with many Tibetan refugees, but Buddhism everywhere. So it's interesting. It's interesting that it's not like things are faded. It's not like things are inevitable. It's that an enlightened mind can see how things are trending. Yeah. So it's not like you know, the future is already set in stone, but we can already see the way things are going. And the clearer our minds become, the farther ahead we can see. Does the importance of lineage make sense or do you not really get why it's so important? Sometimes in academic circles, you know, people rely on source material and they cite all of their sources in the research papers, etc. But sometimes people just kind of come up with their own philosophy randomly out of nowhere and speak it as if it's truth without kind of naming the wisdom that came before it. You know, you see that a lot in like what self-help sections of bookstores and pop psychology and things like that. And sometimes they've got good wisdom in there, right? Like sometimes it's good stuff mixed in with all sorts of other stuff and materialism and whatever. But they're not naming their sources. They're saying as if they came up with it all by themselves. And it's lacks power and depth that way. And it's harder to follow up when you have confusion. So it's, it's important for us if we're ever in a position where we're representing Buddhism, you know, maybe you're asked to give a talk at your kid's school, or maybe you're asked to do this or to do that, you're somehow representing Buddhism in some way, that you are very clear where what you're saying is coming from. You know, you're very clear. It's like, okay, Buddhism says compassion is good. Okay, but who specifically are you relying on when you're explaining it to these other people? You know, we don't want to just kind of be lazy about it, I guess, for lack of a better word. The, the people that will contribute to the degeneration of the Dharma are not non-Buddhists. <laughs> it's going to be Buddhists who contribute to the degeneration of the Dharma by having half understandings that they share in a lazy, unspecific, untidy way, probably with good intentions. But, you know, we need to be really careful that if we're in any way representing Buddhism, even if we don't identify as Buddhists, but just someone who studies Buddhism, that we're very careful about what we say and that we know where to trace back what we're saying to. So um, Yael was asking, what's the literal meaning of the Lam Rim Chenmo? So Lam and Rim mean path stages or stages of the path. And then Chen is the word for like great or big and Mo, treatise. So it's the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment. And we would say that all in English every time, but the Tibetan is so much shorter, we shortcut. So Lam Rim Tren Chenmo, the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa. Treatise is like, uh, I don't know, a big work, <laughs> you know, like a dissertation, <laughs> you know. It's a big work, a treatise. 
Yeah. So Lam Rim in general is like a category of teachings, just like Lo Jong is like the mind training thought transformation teachings and lots of different authors have their own, you know, kind of texts about it. Lam Rim is a general term that means stages of the path teachings derived in some way from Lama Atisha, but Lam Rim Chen Mo is specifically talking about Lama Tsongkhapa's work, if that helps. So, um, for your homework before I forget in practicing the path, um, it's useful to read a little bit more about Lama Atisha and Lama Tsongkhapa. So that's pages 15 to 22. And then pages 45 to 52 is more on the guru and specific advice for finding a guru. Pages 45 to 52. So, um, so that'd be useful um, before next time if you can. And um, you may or may not have had time to look at that outline that I emailed you, but I just wanted to show you it a little bit just so you understand its coolness. I did not make this outline. It's based on um, Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand by Pabanko Rinpoche, which is the commentary we used to use for Lam Rim Chenmo. Um, it was based on the teachings of Pabanko Rinpoche like in the 20s and 30s. And it was one of the first Lam Rim texts that we had in English. We're using Practicing the Path because it's so much more accessible in terms of its English translation and its kind of modern presentation. The outline is basically the same because it's just the Lam Rim Chenmo outline. So this little um, outline that I gave you is a smart text. So if you click on it, it will take you to different places, right? So if you click here, it'll take you to these guys. And if you click on the big one, it'll take you backwards. And we're going to kind of um, go a little bit into Atisha, but you'll read more on, on that in your own time. The greatness of the Dharma, given to increase one's respect for the instruction. Basically, the whole point of this section is the teachings are free from contradiction and are as taught as medicine for one person. How to teach and listen to the teachings. We talked a little bit about this last week, basically to not be biased, to listen with an open mind, to have respect. Mostly what we're gonna look at is the sequence in which disciples are taught. So we have the root of the path, devotion to a spiritual guide, and then what to do in your meditation sessions in between and training once you have a spiritual path um, or a spiritual guide. And that's where we get the stuff about the small, medium and great scopes. Related to that section that um, I was just reading, I thought it might be useful to just have a really short chart that might just kind of tidy it up. So we have Shakyamuni Buddha, right? Who taught the three mothers, the perfection of wisdom sutras, which taught both the profound view and the extensive deeds, meaning method and wisdom that Shakyamuni Buddha taught both explicitly and implicitly. And then those are kind of held by these two Buddhas. So Maitreya, although a deity, a, a full Buddha himself, he appeared as a Bodhisattva at the time of the Buddha and the lineage of extensive deeds was transmitted through him. So the method side was transmitted through Maitreya, the Buddha of loving kindness. And then, although a deity, he has appeared as a bodhisattva at the time of the Buddha, and the lineage of profound view was transmitted through him, Manjushri, so the Buddha of wisdom. So these are two Buddhas who kind of showed the aspect or pretended to be bodhisattvas still training when Buddha was there mostly because it's more efficient to do so. You only kind of want one Buddha talking at a time and then others modeling, you know, senior student behavior, junior student behavior, etc. But both of these, Maitreya and Manjushri, are fully enlightened Buddhas in their own pure realms. And at this stage, we don't see them as human beings walking around on the earth. At this stage, they're hanging out in their pure lands, which are mental states, of course. And so to access them, we had Asanga and Nagarjuna who were in human form, who were real historical figures who actually existed in flesh. And after many years of practice, Asanga met Maitreya directly, went with him to Tashida heaven, the Ganden Pure Land, 
where he received the five great teachings, the ornament of clear realization, etc., which explicitly teaches the extensive deeds. So the whole method side of the path clarified by Asanga. And then also prophesied by the Buddha was Nagarjuna. And through the blessing of Manjushri, he clarified the meaning of the Buddhist teachings on the profound view in the teachings on Madhyamaka. So Nagarjuna, you guys will remember, was our main middle way consequence school scholar. And they passed those on to their own disciples, Supanaditha and Vidyokakila, who combined in Atisha. So all of so both sides, method and wisdom, came together with Lama Atisha. Lama Atisha was invited to Tibet by Janjib U in order to revive the Dharma. He had many auspicious visions and received the blessings of the Buddhas and deities. And in writing the lamp for the path to enlightenment, he combined the teachings of the two lineages and also the lineage of the wave of conduct, which was passed from Manjushri to Shantideva. He clarified how all the teachings of the Buddha are not contradictory, especially in relation to Sutra and Tantra. And then after Lama Atisha came many highly realized teachers, including Dham Trumpa and other kind of Kadampa masters. And then these lineages split again. And it was then with Lama Tsongkhapa that they got tidied up and clarified. So you see the time gap, right? 982 and then 1357. So there was a bit of lag time um, where the teachings of Lama Atisha were the main teachings that held all the stages of the path. And then they got a little bit confused again and Lama Sokafa brought them together again. So he received the three principles of the path that we did our retreat on a couple years ago, directly from Manjushri and combined this with a commentary on Atisha's lamp for the path. And then he wrote Lama Rim Chenmo which was passed down through various highly realized teachers, including Pabanka Rinpoche, Trijang Rinpoche, our own teachers, His Holiness, etc. Okay, so if you just kind of think basically what keeps happening is the teachings are tidy and then they get confused and then they get tidied and then they get confused and then they get tidied. And we want to just always be asking who is the one tidying them? Are they qualified to do so? I know history lesson is sometimes interesting, sometimes not interesting. Um, jump in if you're having ideas. But um, I think because we have time to, we should just kind of go back to where did this all come from? And it's very common when you go to a Lama Rim teaching for whoever's teaching it to say kind of where they got these teachings from. Um, my, my own experience with Lama Rim Chenmo was, my teacher, Kensa Rinpoche Geshe Teshi Sering, he taught this for about eight months. So all three volumes, he went through the whole thing without missing even one sentence. So every single line of the whole Lam Rim Chenmo, he read aloud and explained and read aloud and explained. And it was, you know, full-time coursework for about eight months. And then after that, we did a one month retreat on Lam Rim Chenmo, just Lam Rim for a whole month. And some of us did it in a group and some of it, us did it individually. And then ever after, he teaches usually a five day retreat on the Lam Rim every single year. And, um, you know, teachings like foundation of all good qualities, three principal aspects of the path, these like shorter Lam Rim texts get taught constantly. So um, that's kind of my biggest relationship with Lam Rim Chenwa was those those times that was in 2006 and um, you know it's it's a text that keeps coming up and Lama Atisha's Lamp for the Path which is very short gets taught a lot but basically we we're always trying to think in terms of the three scopes as Mahayanists we're trying to organize ourselves by making sure we have the practices of all three scopes while holding the great scope in our mind as our main motivation and keeping all of the topics the main topics clear in our mind is really important and of course there's tons of topics when you look at the outline and it can be overwhelming but then you read foundation of all good qualities and it's only like 10, 
you know, and they're things that you're familiar with, you know, perfect human rebirth and death and impermanence and karma and its effects, you know, it's things that you already have touched on. And by kind of repeating these things over and over again, they become like your home. You know, and you get a little like, here's my death and impermanent section of my heart. And now every time I get teachings on that, that little section grows and deepens, you know, but you've got a little placeholder for it, you know, and now I'm getting teachings on perfect human rebirth, which I've heard a million times, but there's a placeholder for it and it deepens and grows. So if you can kind of get those like sections settled in your mind, then when you meet the teachings, you don't have that experience of being paralyzed by being overwhelmed with content because you know where everything lives. You know, so you might not have a complete understanding of every single topic, but you know that the topics are there and you have a rough idea of their place in the sequence. It, it really helps with your forward process and it really helps when you're trying to understand where you as an individual are getting stuck. Okay, so we're just going to do a little, a little bit of Atisha because Atisha is fun and very important. Um, I'm going to read from Teachings from Tibet, which you guys got a couple years ago. Um, it's that cover here. And um, the section is on Atisha's lamp for the path to enlightenment. So, of course, before listening to this teaching, first generate bodhicitta thinking. I want to receive enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. In other words, before listening to teachings, it's necessary to think of, to remember all sentient beings. The subject is lamp for the path. So Buddha Dharma had already been established in Tibet before Atisha's arrival there, but an evil king called Long Dharma, who was said to have horns growing from his head, hated the Dharma and caused it to degenerate in Tibet. But even though the teachings had been corrupted, they still existed, just not as purely as before. It took about 60 years to restore the teachings to their original purity in what became known in the later spreading of the Dharma in Tibet. How that happened was that in Western Tibet, in the kingdom of Guje, there lived a Tibetan king, Hua Lama Yeshi -e, and his nephew, Janshiba. They decided to invite a learned and realized teacher from a great Indian monastery of Vikramashila to spread Dharma in Tibet. When they investigated to see who was the most learned and realized person there, they discovered that Atisha would be by far the best one to invite. But before Lama Hla Lama Yeshe'u could request Atisha to come from Vikramashila to Tibet, he needed to find gold to make a proper offering so went to a place called Garlong in search of it. However, before he could accomplish that mission, the ruler of Garlong threw him in prison where he died. In that way, Hla Lama Yeshi O sacrificed his life to bring Lama Atisha to Tibet. Then his nephew sent emissaries to India to invite Lama Atisha to Tibet. When he finally met Atisha, he explained how the Dharma had degenerated during Long Dharma's rule and how correct teachings no longer existed in Tibet and requested Atisha to give the Tibetan people fundamental teachings on refuge, bodhicitta and so forth because they were so ignorant. Therefore, Lama Atisha wrote the precious teachings, a lamp for the path to enlightenment. This text is based on the Prajnaparamita teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha and is the source of not only all the Gelug Lamrim teachings, but also those of the other main schools of Tibetan Buddhism, Nyingma Kagyu Sakya which all practice the graduated path to enlightenment and to quote it in their teachings. Okay, so when you hear Lam Rim, think three scopes. We've talked about the three scopes in the past. How do you understand them? What's, what are the main points or the main goals of the small scope or initial scope? A better, better rebirth, something like this. Yes, yes. Yes, better rebirth. Yep. Yeah, what sort of topics are in the small scope? Do you remember? They don't have to be in any particular order, just, you know, things that go in that category of trying to achieve a better rebirth and a mean. To practice the. To, 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 to practice the Dhamma. 
-hmm. Yeah, specifically, specifically what? To learn the wisdom of the Dharma, the, the wisdom part, the Dharma for our own sake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, individual liberation starts to become the goal in the small scope. Um, it's almost even less than that. Yeah. Sorry, go on. You have to know about karma. Yes, yes. Yep. Does anybody know the Hebrew term for the word scope? That, not the translation uh, from English, but the, the Hebrew term for it when... Uh, when dealing with the Dharma? It's actually connected to the Hekef. The word scope is connected to the Hekef, to the Yeda and to the Hekhaivut. But in fact, you can call it a level in the way. It's like... It's equally to the stages. It's a kind of uh, something that summarizes uh, bunches of the stages. Is it the same word that you use for the sight in a gun? Because in English, you know, you have a gun and you have the thing on top of the gun. It's called a scope. And, yeah. you know, it, yeah, is it the same word? Yeah. And so it it's has like, to do with, um, um, with intention. It, it's yeah. the same uh, root as intention. Um, the word in Hebrew for the scope, for the gun scope, mm. has the same uh, root. Uh, root letters as the word intention, kavana. Oh, that's nice. That's a good connotation. It's not in English, but it could be, and it would be good if it were. So it's better in Hebrew then, um, because it's talking what about is, both. Yeah, what you intend and where are you directing yourself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And this is what we mean by the three scopes. It's like, how much can you see in the vision and which and where do you want to go with it, okay. you know, both. It has both connotations. Yeah, so, you know, the scope of the vision of the small scope is, you know, specific things related to what will get you a better rebirth. You know, it's like, what are the ingredients or what's the focus that you need in order to get to a good rebirth? Then the middle scope are, you know, what, are the, what is the scope of the vision of things that will take you to nirvana? And then the great scope, what are the scope of things that will take you to full enlightenment? And it's not like you could have only the great scope content and get there. It's like, you know, you start with this one and you get bigger and bigger and bigger, but you can't just start big. You know, you need your initial scope practices. They're like essential foundations. Um, and so we just look at that chart again that you've seen many times, but it's important to kind of get it clear in your head, right? So relying on a spiritual teacher, how to meditate and perfect human rebirth, these are just preliminaries, right? This is to make this life meaningful by pursuing some sort of spiritual path, right? Connection, purpose, meaning, just like all the good stuff that most people are trying to achieve in some way, even if they don't define it in these terms, you know, mentorship and mentoring others, you know, learning how to look within and have introspection and taking advantage of the opportunities you have, you know, so this can be very secularly presented. But the initial scope really is to have another perfect human rebirth or higher so you can continue the spiritual path. And so the initial scope or the small scope there's a lot on impermanence and death to make you take advantage of your perfect human rebirth, right? There's a link between these two. The only reason to look at impermanence and death is to make you go, wow, I have an amazing opportunity, but it's temporary. And what comes next might not be so good if I don't direct my mind, you know? So this impermanence death has a link up and a link down or, a, you know, sideways, sideways but there's a lot of reasons to look at this one. And then karma comes here, and then it also comes here in the medium scope. Reflecting on the three lower realms, this is to develop ethics mainly, mindfulness and restraint, non-harmfulness, and hopefully also compassion. And then refuge, we've talked about before, is fear of what your untamed mind can create now and in the future 
together with the faith of conviction that the Buddhist tradition offers accurate advice and how to tame that mind. So from that place, it naturally leads to an examination of the Four Noble Truths of suffering in general, so that you develop a determination to be free. You know, there's no point in looking at all this suffering unless it's either going to help you generate compassion and empathy or and help you get out of samsara. So you want to be motivated. And that motivation to get out of samsara leads you to practicing the three higher trainings. And their goal here is to achieve nirvana, which is liberation from samsara. So these three sections are held in common with all Buddhists. Yeah, every tradition has these. Then specific to the Mahayana is the great scope. And that's where it's all bodhicitta all the time. And we get Tantra as well. So the wisdom side of the path, the wisdom realizing emptiness is theoretically held in common with all schools of thought of Buddhism, even though there's different tenant schools and things like that. But the wisdom side is the same. It's the method you bring to it and the goal of the method that's different. Yeah, if you're us. Can, can you please say more uh, about the, the relation between uh, Great Scope and Tantric? Yeah, well, the only reason to practice Tantra is Bodhicitta. You only practice Tantra because of your Bodhicitta. Otherwise, there's no need for it, right? So it's only for the benefit of others that you have enough strength of will and enough kind of depth of ethics to approach very difficult energies like attachment and anger and transform them into things that are beneficial without getting lost in the indulgence of the enjoyment and drama of those energies. So if it was only for your own sake, you'd just get swept up into samsara even worse because you start playing with your chakras, you start getting all into energy systems and it's just kind of fun and then it just actually makes samsara worse for yourself. So the only reason to practice Tantra is bodhicitta for the reason of otherwise you won't have a great enough willpower to move forward with things that are very tempting. The other reason is the speed. So sentient beings are suffering right now and we have a karmic connection with a lot of them who we could benefit if our state of mind was more developed. But because our state of mind is not as developed, we can only help them in a limited way. So because we feel this sense of urgency that they need us now, and we could help them, but we can't yet because our minds aren't clear enough, we practice Tantra because it's quicker. But it's quicker because it's harder. You know, the amount of merit that you accumulate with Tantra is exponentially more than on the Sutra path, but you have to be really focused you know, otherwise it's not gonna go anywhere. So Tantra is like Mahayana plus or Mahayana quick. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's something that requires very stable ethics and good concentration and solid renunciation bodhicitta. Theoretically, you've re realized renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view before you practice Tantra, but you at least have to have a really, really clear intellectual understanding and a very solid conviction in bodhicitta before practicing it. So lots and lots of topics in Buddhism can be practiced by non-Buddhists, right? Most topics in Buddhism can be practiced by non-Buddhists. Tantra is not one of them you absolutely need a teacher um, or you can really go down a bad road. You absolutely need a deep heart connection with refuge. Yeah. Um, Cause you're, you're kind of playing with fire. Yeah. I don't know. Did that answer your question or were you coming at it from a different angle? No, that's, that's fine. Understanding. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I mean, it's such a delicate word. It's such a misunderstood word. The iconography of Tantra confuses people. Um, and then there's Hindu Tantra, which is also very beautiful and sacred, but different, which is also misunderstood and co-opted, you know, so it's elements of Tantra are sometimes extracted by, you know, pop 
yoga, you know, not real yoga, but like people that think they're practicing yoga and they call it, you know, kundalini yoga or whatever. And it's, it just becomes another form of spiritual materialism and another form of hedonism. But the danger is you're not even identifying it correctly. Like if you eat chocolate cake, you know that you're being hedonistic and you can just enjoy it and kind of like work on your attachment. But if you call it spiritual practice when it's not, it can get really icky really quickly. You know, and so there is a lot of that like co-opting and extracting tiny parts of Tantra used in this kind of uninformed, really ignorant way. And it's very dangerous. Um, so anyway, if you see it, run, <laughs> right? Run the other way. Yeah. And if people have a, a predisposition to mental illness of a severe type, like schizophrenia or like different dissociative disorders, sometimes practicing Tantra too soon can trigger a psychotic break. So anyway, <laughs> I know it's, a, it's I'm being heavy, but it's important to realize that um, you're probably all qualified to practice Tantra if you had a guru. You're sane enough, kind enough people, but you really need a guru, a Vajrayana guru, not a regular sutra guru. And that's, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the three scopes, um, when you hear Lam Rim, think three scopes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So more, more about the structure of the Lam Rim that you wanted to ask about, or kind of where different things fit, or the link between things. Can, can I ask you then? Yeah, I'm asking if is it it's it's like a textbook for uh, non-religious or simple people that learning. It's 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 like a, a sim simple uh, way of teaching the, the 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 Dharma. It's it's deceptively simple. <laughs> it seems simple. No, no, I'm, I'm asking if, 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 if uh, who, who is learning the, is it a part of? In a way, it's very practical and it seems quite simple, like one, two, three, four, five, six, like it seems quite simple, but it actually is advanced. Um, and the Lam Rim doesn't explicitly talk about Tantra, but it points to Tantra. And basically what we do in the nunnery is we usually study we had like a five to seven year study program that would just kind of rotate for a while. And then, you know, anyway, there was variations, but basically full-time study for seven years. The first three years were usually like minds and mental factors and the seven types of awareness and tenants, which, you know, are complicated things, but we actually learned those first. Like, how does the mind work? What's the general idea about reality? What's the self? It's you know, that's what we, and then we went into Lam Rim, like the fourth or fifth year we did Lam Rim. Wow, okay. And then after Lam Rim, then we would start doing tantric commentaries and tantric practice. Um, so it was always like uh, foundational knowledge, even though it was intellectually harder to understand low rig and tenants, right? Low rig and tenants are hard to understand intellectually, but they're actually more foundational understanding about like the worldview once you kind of understand about the worldview then you can take that knowledge into the lam rim which is intellectually easier but much harder in terms of practice does that make i don't know does that make sense yeah yeah thank yeah. you yeah yeah like that so it's not like they teach the lam rim to little kids you know that's it's um it needs a lot of context for it to land right I think that uh, Sigalit asked also about the, who is the audience. Is it has to be only a monastic uh, studies, or can it be a secular or studied by by people like us? I mean, it normally wouldn't be taught in a secular way, but certainly it could be taught to lay people, just lay Buddhist people. Yeah, lay Buddhist people and monks and nuns. Um, you know, lay Buddhist people who are kind of hardcore and really like their practice and are like into it. <laughs> um, it's taught in a, it's really not taught in a secular way, but it can be taught to a secular audience. Do, do you feel the distinction? It's like here, here it is straight, 
But then if you're a totally secular person, you just apply what makes sense to you from that. You know, so my, my approach is to try and teach in a somewhat secular way with you guys, because I know not everyone is Buddhist, but some of the topics really do rely on an assumption or a belief in cause and effect karma and past and future lives. And so the topics that rely on that worldview, you take with a grain of salt, you know? If it works for you, take it on board. If it doesn't work for you, you set it aside. So, you know, it's taught in a non-secular way, but you can hear it in a secular way if you want to. Yeah, it's your choice. I don't know, is that is that what you meant or were you? Yeah, <laughs> ish. Yeah. It's, it's profound stuff, you know, it's really, um, when I did the retreat, it was much harder than I thought it would be. It was much harder than a single pointed concentration retreat. It was harder than some of my highest yoga tantra retreats. It was really confronting to go through the Lam Rim experientially, even though intellectually, you know, I get it, no, no problem. But yeah, experientially, it's really confronting some of our deepest habits of self-soothing, some of our deepest habits of I don't know, connection in good and bad ways. It, it confronts so much about what our assumptions about what gives us happiness and suffering are. It's really, it's deep stuff. But only if you let it be. Otherwise, it's just kind of a intellectual exercise. Yeah. So, um, so have a little look at those sections that I mentioned before, a little bit more about Lama Tisha and Lama Sankapa. It, it's useful to just kind of connect with at least those two. Um, and then more on the guru next week and then we'll get into perfect human rebirth and things like that and um if if you're looking through the lom rim outline or the appendix in the back outline do try and flag the parts that you wanted to make sure to ask things about you know when they came up in the past and you wondered about this or that or you wanted something to be fleshed out um please do you know because it's it's what i'm here for right <laughs> so if there's bits that you wanted to go into more deeply please tell me and um we'll just do a short dedication so this final lam rim dedication was also written by lama Sonkapa. and i'll just read the first two verses from my two collections, vast as space, that I've amassed from working with effort at this practice for a great length of time. May I become the chief leading Buddha for all those whose mind's wisdom eye is blinded by ignorance. Even if I do not reach this state, may I be held in your loving compassion for all lives, Manjushri. May I find the best of complete graded paths of the teachings, and may I please all the Buddhas by my practice.